So in three, yes. two. Good afternoon. I'm now, now called to order the meeting of the Building and Contracts Committee for Monday, September 12, 2022. In accordance with board policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to conduct this meeting efficiently, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board committee members will say their names before making and seconding a motion, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Fayer, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Ms. Jones? Present. Mr. McMillian? Present. Ms. Han? Mr. Kuhn? Mr. Offerman? Present. Thank you, Ms. Fayer. Ms. Fayer, please call the role of staff members participating in today's meeting. Dr. Miriam Yarbrough. Ms. Shira Anderson. Present. Mr. Pedro Augusto. Dr. Mary Boswell-McComas. Uh, oh, sorry, thank you. Dr. Mary Boswell-McComas. I'm present. Ms. Mildred Charlie Green. Dr. Michael Zarchin. Mr. Chris Hartlove. Present. Anna Rungfar Sangaroon. Present. Dr. Jeffrey Holmes. Ms. Maria Lowry. Present. Mr. Kevin Connolly. Present. Mr. James Corns. Present. Mr. Pete Dixit. Present. Ms. Kimberly Ferguson. Present. Ms. Megan Shea. Present. Dr. Melissa Wistead. Present. Ms. Joanne English Calvert. Present. Ms. Jamie Hetzler. Mr. Merrill Plate. Present. Ms. Stacy Shack. Present. Ms. Michelle Sansbury. Present. Ms. Melanie Webster. Present. Dr. Heather Woolrich. Present. Mr. John Salerno. Present. If there are additional staff participating that were not mentioned, please state your name now. Debbie Somerville. Thank you. Kisele Mshinda. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fayou. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Mr. Hartlove, please state your name for the record and proceed with presenting the first contract. Thank you. Uh, my name is Chris Hartlove. The first uh, contract on the agenda is ARA-201-23, Council for the Board of Education, Baltimore County. The, the county had procured legal counsel for the board on January 11th, 2022. On July 1st, 2022, Section 4-104 of the state code was amended to permit the board to retain its own counsel. Initially, staff recommended piggybacking the original contract. After the agenda was published, concerns were raised about whether the county had recommended a cooperative contract. After discussion with the county, we agreed that an assignment of the contract was a more efficient way to move forward, as an assignment would eliminate the need to have the county involved with future renewal terms and allow for a cleaner transition. We are therefore recommending the contract be approved 
as an assignment and not a piggyback. Thank you, Mr. Hartlow. Committee members, any questions? Hi, Ms. Joes. This is Mr. Kuhn. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm just signing on now. <clears throat> um, but I, I do have a question for Mr. Hartlow or whoever else can, can answer this. I'm, I'm just trying to follow what that all means because um, there's a contract that the county's executed on our behalf, but we pay for, correct? Correct. And what is actually changing? The, the only thing, and, and uh, maybe legal can jump in if, if this is not uh, uh, sufficient of an answer, but um, the only thing that's changed is now that we can have our own, um, our own contract, this actually assigns the contract to us. It, the terms are the same, everything is the same. Um, it's just now instead of it's instead of the contract being with the county for us, the contract is now directly between us and the and the legal firm. So it helps it helps going forward. It's it's really uh, uh, I, in my estimation, and I'm not a lawyer, but it's a nuance. It doesn't seem doesn't seem to change the terms or anything very, that's important to to the contract. Okay, I don't know if legal has any if uh, legal has anything they want to add to that. That would certainly be welcome. That, that's correct, Chris. Uh, if that they answered your question or not, um, but the terms do not change with this assignment. Uh, it would just simply be a contract between the board and its own council and taking out the middleman of the county. Now that we can do that. OK, so just so I'm clear. We're just putting Board of Education where Baltimore County. <laughs> the, the words Baltimore County used to be and now it just says Board of Education is the direct entity um, that has this contract at this point. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, so the assignment would be a transfer from the board to, uh, I mean, from the county to the board uh, so that we can properly take over the contract versus a piggyback, which is where we would um, do our own contract and piggyback this weird quasi contract uh, on our behalf anyway. Does that make more sense? Yeah, it sounds pretty simple and straightforward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. Mr. Hartlove, I'm confused on this whole process. I know that we legally received, we meaning the Board of Education, received permission to to uh, secure our own legal services, our own legal firm. But then the county was was all wrapped up into that process, from my understanding, so that the county did the RFP for this. There was two firms came back and then some of the county and some of us, or some of our previous leadership got together and agreed on the current on the current firm. And now we're taking this over. Can you can you help clear up the mud for me, please? I can try. Uh, I think yeah. What you're referring to is the original contract, and that was that was done on the count on our behalf by the county, and that was done prior to the the legal change that allowed us to have our own uh, um, um, legal counsel. Okay. So so that's why we did it. We would never have, it, had this had had we not had legal counsel at that point in time. We would have just and this law was in effect. We would have just gone out and did it on our own the way we do any other service. But because the law at that time what didn't allow us to have our own legal counsel, the board to have their own legal counsel, we had to go through the, the, the county to, to the county had to procure it on our behalf. And now all we're doing is since we just did that procurement back in January, we're just in effect taking that over. We're taking that, that, that contract over, no changes to the contract. It's now, just between, as I think uh, a legal counsel had referred to, taking out the middleman. We're now, it's now us directly with the legal firm as, a, as opposed to the legal firm working with the county on our behalf. 
Okay, now I'm still confused. So the the county put out the RFP, correct? Back in the day before we had permission. Correct. Okay, so we had, are you, was it two law firms that responded? I'm not familiar with the RFP. I don't know if, okay. um, if we have anybody on the, the call who is familiar with the RFP. Okay, but even regardless of that, it just seems to me that like they orchestrated this deal. And now, you know, we're taking it over, but we, as a board, we didn't really have, you know, the majority of us, we didn't have input in on that, that deal that we're right. now taking over. Is what, I, what I would say, Mr. McMillian, is nothing changes with this. We still have a 30 day out if we want. So there's, there's nothing that's changed with our ability. We're not like, this is not making the, the contract a longer term or anything to that, to that. So if the board were to decide they wanted to look for a different firm, certainly could do that. Um, this is not locking you in. It's just, it's it's really, it's I, I, I believe it's a bit of a, um, it's a, a, it's not changing any of the dynamics that we currently have. Okay, I my understanding f through conversation with another individual that it was a long term, a multi year deal that we were then assuming, and I nobody explained to me that there was a way out of that. Uh, okay, it I is, really I really yeah. appreciate your time. Yeah, and you were correct; it is a multi year deal, but w with the deal, we do have a thirty day uh, out. Okay, thirty days from today, or how's that thirty days work? Um, I don't know, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Webster, if you want to talk exactly how that would work if we wanted to go down that road. All of our contracts include a 30 day termination notice for convenience. So upon giving notice to the company, we can terminate 30 days after the notice is delivered. OK, so suppose in six months we wanted to start this process, then if the board agreed, then we could do that in six months. Thank you. Thank you very much for helping me. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. Thank you, Mr. Hartlow, for answering those questions. Committee members, any more questions? Hearing none, we'll proceed to the next contract. Mr. Hartlow, please proceed with presenting. Um, second contract is MWE-856-14. This is a consent to assignment of the contract from Follett School Solutions to Follett Contact Solutions, LLC. Committee members, any questions? Miss, Miss uh, Jones, I have a <laughs> Go question. Ahead. Go ahead. I wasn't on, the, I just recently became reassigned to the curriculum committee. I was on that com committee for a number of, of years and then things switched around and that kind of stuff. Ms. Shea, have, because I haven't been on this in a while, has the committee talked about this? Is this coming to us with a recommendation from the committee? So this was discussed at a recent, good afternoon, Mr. McMillian, and welcome back to the curriculum committee. Oh, thank you. We're happy to have you back. Um, this was uh, this contract is a name change. So we did give a courtesy update at a recent curriculum committee um, in terms of our presentation, but then I believe that curriculum committee meeting was canceled. Um, so we had submitted a slide that was posted as part of the um, board docs just updating this curriculum committee was originally discussed um, before you were even on the board in 2014, so you didn't miss this one. Um, this is just a name change for the company that distributes copies of our collection series in eighth grade, so schools that need to replace a copy if something is lost um, or replenish if they have growth. Um, one of the companies that we, one of the vendors that we use to purchase those um, was acquired, and so we have a name change on the contract. But we did provide an update to the curriculum committee letting know that this would be coming, but then that meeting was canceled. OK, so. So then it did, if it was canceled, so there's no recommendation from the committee right. So when we were bringing it as a courtesy, it wasn't really a recommendation anyway, because it wasn't a new contract. We um, Dr. McComas just asks us to give sort of a courtesy heads up to the curriculum committee when we have an instruction of material that will be coming forward as a contract. So even if the meeting hadn't been canceled, it wouldn't have been like a voting item because it's just a courtesy to let everyone know that we'd be talking about an instructional material. And can right. you share, can you, sh thank you. And can sure. you share, 
share any information. Is there something out there about a 14 day of review from the public? Is there a superintendent's rule, some, you know, 6002 evaluation selection of a structural material? Yes, sir. So that's when we are uh, policy and rule 6002 outlines the selection process for instructional materials. So when we're purchasing a new instructional material, uh, so think about some of our recent purchases, such as like illustrative math or open court or the Bridges math program. Part of that process includes a public review process in which the items are on display um, physically, uh, typically in Greenwood and certainly Miss Webster can comment. Sometimes they're um, accessible digitally and we have an opportunity for uh, the public if it's a digital resource to access it that way. Um, and then there is rule 6002 form A, which citizens as they come to review any materials on public display can let us know of any concern. So that is a part of the policy. So that would have happened for this resource back in 2014 when it was first uh, selected and purchased. OK, so this is to help you clarify. This is basically a, a company name change. And this is a company exactly. name change exactly for a material okay. that's been in place for quite some time. Thank you. Thanks again for your help. Thank you very much. You got it. Thank you, Mr. McCullion. Thank you, Ms. Shea. Committee members, any more questions? Uh, Ms. Jones, I have a, a, just a quick question <clears throat> regarding okay. this item. Um, the books that we're purchasing, are they the same books that we were purchasing in 2014 or how is that handled? Yes, and what this, public we're input actually not making, made? We're not, Yes, I'm sorry. We're, we're actually not making a new purchase. This is back in 2014 when this was first approved, the county made a system wide purchase of these eighth grade anthologies. But we continue to have spending authority so that if schools need to replace a, a, a text that is damaged or if schools see enrollment shifts. So this is one of the vendors that's used only as needed. So you can see on the board exhibit the amount of money that we actually uh, project spending annually is somewhat minimal. So we're not making a system wide purchase. This is just a uh, spending authority that's available should a school or someone need to purchase a replacement of the same core anthology or one of the original novels that was purchased when that anthology was selected in 2014. All right, thanks. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Thank you, Ms. Shea. Hearing no more questions. Mr. Hartlow, please present the next contract, please. Contract 3, JME-530-21, Statistics, Text, Digital Access. This contract modification will provide for the continued use of AP statistics instructional materials for the Department of Academics. Approval is requested to increase the contract spending authority by 102,000, bringing the revised total contract spending authority to 354,000 with one awarded contract contractor approved by the board on June 8th, 2021. Thank you, Mr. Hartlow. Mr. Kuhn has a question. Thanks. I, I, I realize um, and I, I fully support this activity. Um, it just said in the, just so I'm clear, it said in the exhibit that due to basically more kids taking the test, the price is going up $800,000. Um, so I was just curious about how many more kids are actually taking the test or what we're, what we're budgeting for. And how that number, you know, comes up. Is it $10 a test? Is it $100 a test? I'm, I'm just curious. So I think, Mr. Kuhn, um, you might be combining two contracts. This particular one is for actually the textbooks for the statistics course. So it's not about the All right, test. I'm getting ahead of myself. Yeah, you know you're getting ahead to another the, contract. The um, but, right. but you're on I'll... the right track that we are seeing an <laughs> enrollment increase in our statistics courses, which is what precipitated the need to increase the authority. So you're on the right track, just a different contract. I will hold my question for that contract. Thank you. Okie doke. You've given Dr. Wildridge a, a sneak preview. <laughs> Thank you. Committee members, any more questions? Hearing none, uh, Mr. Hartlow, please proceed with the next contract. Contract 4 GDA-326-22 Academic Enrichment Programs Out of School Time Services. This is a new competitively bid contract for academic enrichment programs for the Office of Title I. Approval is requested for 
a five year contract with nine recommended bidders and contract spending authority of twenty six million two hundred and twenty thousand dollars. This is uh, grant funded. The services will be uh, procured using uh, blueprint for Maryland's future concentration of poverty grant funds. Thank you, Mr. Hartlow. Um, I do have a question. This is a competitively bid contract. Did this come through curriculum or is it coming straight to building and contracts? Hey, this is Melissa. Unfortunately, my, my camera is not working, um, but I'm trying to, to be on with you. Uh, so we were supposed to come to the curriculum committee. We had the slideshow, it was posted, but that one was canceled. So um, I suppose it's coming directly here, although we attempted to bring it to curriculum committee last month. OK, and this is uh, coming into grant money and it's, it's um, quite a large grant, 26 million spread over five years. Um, some of the vendors, can you describe some of the services that's going to be provided to the Title I schools? And does this include all Title I schools? Grade, kindergarten through 12th yeah. grade? Ms. Stansberry, do you want to share? It's not Title yes. I schools, it's the community schools, but go ahead, Ms. Stansberry. Yes, can explain? yes. Um, schools are identified by the state annually, and for the past four years, we've doubled the number of schools every year. Um, we had 22 last year. This year we have 38, and we're projecting 72 schools next year. So the large amount of funding is to account for schools that have not yet onboarded yet. And funding is gradually increased annually over the next six years, which means the funding that schools have now will increase significantly. Some of the vendors will provide things such as um, music classes for students. Um, there are some vendors that are um, going to provide um, sewing and cooking and um, arts and engineering activities all that embed and and allow students to apply skills taught during the school day to real world extension activities beyond the school day so um, there are a variety of vendors and a variety of options with each of those vendors and so how do um the students get picked because I'm, because i'm seeing vendors here like a tutoring company i'm also seeing ymca um, and is this after school? And can you at a future meeting provide a breakdown to the board and on the schools and the services that are provided to the students? So at the moment, we don't know exactly which schools will need this service before schools can use funding. They have to complete a needs assessment and um, have a shared decision making team meeting that prioritize, prioritizes this activity as a need. Um, we could give you a list of schools who are interested in the moment, but that list will grow and shift and change annually and even within a year during that particular school year. But we'd be happy to give you some early projections. And Ms. Joyce, I'll just follow up uh, and piggyback that along with what Ms. Stansberry shared, we can always provide updates through Curriculum Committee on how our um, community schools programs are going and how these programs are going as a reflection of the concentration and poverty grant. Thank you. So would this be monitored under your department, Dr. McComas? Yes, uh, Ms. Stansberry is our Title I um, director who helps us oversee the concentration and poverty and community schools initiative. Um, and so she is in uh, Dr. Wistead's team, which is they're all part of my team. All right, thank you. Uh, committee I members, any? Any more questions? Hearing none, Mr. Hartlow, please proceed with the next contract. OK, uh, the next contract is LLY-430-22 Equitable Services Title I Tutoring. This is a new competitively bid contract for Title I tutoring services for the Office of Title I. Approval is requested for a five year contract with 11 recommended bidders and contract spending authority of $300,000. Thank you. Mr. Offerman has a question. I'm actually one contract early. I apologize. OK, thank you. Committee members, any more questions? 
Um, I have a quick question. This is a tutoring service and um, we just had another contract prior to this, Ms. Tansbury, which also had tutoring services. Uh, how uh, is this contract different? I see this is a grant as well, but. Right, um, so the Title I grant is required to set aside a certain portion of its allocation to provide students who reside in Title I communities in both Title I attendance areas and attend private schools with tutoring services. These services are specifically for students who do not attend BCPS, but reside in those communities. And so um, the private school officials will have the option of selecting a vendor to render those services for their students, along with provide family engagement for their families. So this is a private school tutoring that we are providing to grants? Correct. So it is a requirement of the grant, of the Title I grant, to set aside um, an equitable portion for students that attend private schools but reside in Title I attendance areas. So we, it's not... Uh, go ahead, Ms. McComas. So it's not... Doc, yeah, I, yeah, that's I just, fine. It seems like that it's not income-based, so you could reside in a Title I um area and you could be a millionaire and your kid could go to, to a private school and you could still use this tutoring service am i hearing that correct yes and also Ms. just just to explain that it's not unique to the title one grant all of our federal grants require that we keep a portion of it aside to serve students in private schools so if that helps um alleviate your concerns it's a requirement of every grant yeah, we essentially serve as the pass through agency. So the money comes from the federal government, passes through MSDE, passes through us, and then on to the non uh, public. Yep, and students have to, excuse me, demonstrate an academic need. So um, one is the where they reside, and two is that they have an academic need. It's good to know. Thank you. Committee members, any more questions? Ms. Joes, just a quick question, follow up question. Um, yes. Is a is the one charter school that Baltimore currently Baltimore County currently has is that considered? Would, would these funds be available to that school, or is that not considered a private school? Correct. Right, that is not considered a private school. Yeah, that's a public school. That's still a public school. All right, I just wanted to make sure. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Hartlove, can you please proceed with the next contract? Sure. Uh, the next one is another um, name change. It's uh, JBO-712-18. This is a consent to assignment of this contract from Naviance Inc. to Power Schools Group. Thank you. Committee members, any questions? This is Mr. Offerman. Uh, he just answered my question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Um, committee members, any more questions? Looks like it's just a name change. Um, hearing none, Mr. Hartlow, please proceed with the next contract. Contract 7 LKO-401-21, Nursing and First Aid Supplies. This contract modification will provide for the continued purchase of nursing and first aid supplies for the Office of Health Services. This is also a consent to the assignment of this contract from BSN Sports to BSN Sports LLC. Approval is requested to increase contract spending authority by 1,675,000, bringing the revised total contract spending authority to 2,825,000, with seven awarded contractors approved by the board on October 13, 2020. Thank you, Mr. Hartlow. Mr. McMillian has a question. Well, Summerfield, how are you guys today? Very well, thank you. Summerville. Um, so this money, is is it like divided up? We've got 176 schools. Does each school get a piece of this money to purchase first aid supplies the way they need it? 
The answer really is yes and. So yes, the schools can order directly. And for the PPE part of it, we have we have managed that centrally to make sure that they get it in an expedited way. So we have it in the warehouse and they order it honestly through logistics. And my team orders, maintains the supply in, at logistics. Now, I noticed somebody that was requesting from community like children's Tylenol for a particular school. And I just thought that that was odd. You know, as a former athletic director, if I needed athletic tape, I, I wouldn't have made a plea to the public to, you know, donate athletic tape to me. Is that just because, you know, probably they had a, an exorbitant need for that or they didn't have any on hand or it's hard to that, tell? That would not be appropriate. That's that's provided centrally from our office. All medicines are. Using okay. this contract. OK, thank you very much. You're welcome. To just um, follow up on Mr. McMillian's question, so if there was a need, who would they contact for? The, so for um, medications? Yes, or any kind of first aid services. So medication, so it, it's, it's kind of, it's handled a little bit complexly. The medications are bought centrally in bulk and distributed to nurses through the Office of Health Services. So they know, the nurses know to call Kim Sluss in my office and we get them the medicines. Um, the first aid supplies, each school has a small budget that provides for anticipated low cost first aid supplies. So Band-Aids, the nurses order their preferred type of Band-Aid and the right size for their children and the right color and all that kind of stuff. For larger cost items like um, uh, the electronic thermometers that cost several hundred dollars, my office is per office purchases them because the school budget isn't sufficient. OK, and it looks like Mr. Kuhn has a question. Thanks, just a quick follow up. I'm, I'm just looking at the scale of the increase um, and I was hoping you could explain that. Um, you know why the growth of 1.6 million. Um, is, the, the, is something yeah changed i mean COVID has happened and, you know we've spent a tremendous amount of money and testing and all that kind of stuff but what is there a specific driver to the increase or is it just because of time it's the time and the COVID ppe honestly so it's it's those two things we are seeing significant inflation in certain of the medicines that we're trying to manage but it's it's a com it's mostly it's mostly COVID that's impacted the the cost the cost on this contract All right, thank you. Committee members, any more questions? Um, hearing none, thank you, Ms. Somerville. Thank you, Ms. Ferguson. Mr. Hartlow, please proceed with the next contract. Uh, contract 8 LLY 400 23 physical examinations. This is a newly, this is a new competitively bid contract for physical examinations for the Department of Human Resources, recruitment and staffing. Approval is requested for a five year contract with one recommended bidder and contract spending authority of $500,000. Thank you, Mr. Hartlow. Committee members, any questions? Hearing none, Mr. Hartlow, please proceed with the next contract. Contract 9 is uh, JNI-730-11 Preliminary Scholastic Achievement Test National Merit Scholarship Qualifying Test. This contract modification will provide for the college and career readiness assessments for students in grades 9 through 11, including PSAT, PSAT, uh, NMSQT. SAT and AP exams, as well as AP teacher workshops and AP teacher mentoring. Approval is requested to increase contract spending authority by $800,000 due to increased student enrollment, bringing the revised total spending authority to 8,417,766,000 with one awarded contract contractor approved by the board on September 7th, 2010. Thank you, Mr. Offerman, please go ahead. Yes, uh, in that list of uh, tests, you mentioned the advanced placement tests. Uh, 
I was under the impression that students paid for their own unless they had financial need and they could get a partial reduction from the uh, from the college board. Uh, is is this some kind of supplement to that or are we paying now for uh, all the AP tests? Dr. Offerman, I can respond to that. This is Melissa Wistead. Um, so yes, with the blueprint for Maryland's future, money that has come in under the college and career readiness uh, section of it, we are paying for one AP exam for every student. And then we are continuing to use Title IV funds to uh, pay for every AP exam for a student who's economically disadvantaged. Well, that is certainly good to hear. Thank you. Surely. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Uh, is that one AP test per year or one AP test per student? Both, one AP test for each student per year. So technically a student could get up to four AP tests for, paid for in four years. Right. All right, thank you. Committee members, uh, looks like Mr. McMillian has a question. Kuhn is before I am. I'll yeah. go ahead, Mr. Kuhn. Thanks. Uh, just to follow up on uh, Mr. Offerman's question, um, it's very clearly stated that there are waivers um, depending on income levels and what have you. So um, I'm I'm con I was just concerned with something I just heard that we're going to pay for all PA. I'm sorry, we're going to pay for all AP. Um, tests for um, students in need, but my understanding is there are waivers available. So uh, can someone please clarify that? Hi, Mr. Kuhn. This is Kevin Connolly, Executive Director for Research Accountability and Assessment. How are you? I'm all right, thank you. Good, good. I, I just wanted to um, share a couple things with you. Uh, one, um, we have line item uh, money reserved for AP exams for students who do get a reduced cost. So we have um, you know, a certain amount projected for that, which is $115,000. So that is a reduction in the price of the overall test. While for AP exams for students who do not receive economic aid, uh, we have re projected $750,000. And also to clarify, Mr. Kuhn, that it's um, the waiver is not a complete free exam. The, the students that are economically disadvantaged just get a reduction in the exam. It still costs money. Okay, great. And um, to follow on, I, I mean, this is all great news. Um, to follow on, this is also talking about SAT and PSAT. Um, are there, I mean, are you? You're projecting more students taking more tests, and that's driving the the eight hundred thousand dollars. I'm I'm just trying to understand kind of sure. down to what we're looking at. Sure. So we can look at um, growth in two different ways. Pre-pandemic, our average enrollment for the two years prior was one hundred fourteen thousand five hundred students. Um, during pandemic, it was 111,000 students. So the overall cost has an impact just by the difference of those 3,000 kids. And we're talking about students in grades, again, 9 through 11. In addition to that, our projections for um, AP Computer Science has gone up almost $8,000. Uh, from last year to this year for the for students taking those AP exams, which is fantastic. Uh, SAT school day just based on the changes in enrollment is an increase of $45,000. AP exams for students that are not eligible for um, academic aid is, is another uh, $90,000. And then PSAT for students in grades 9 through 11 for the fall is an additional $25,000. So we have a change in the total number of students, um, which then impacts you know, the cost per assessment, but we also have an increase in the number of students taking AP exams as well. Great, and and just one final point that I'd like to make. The College Board is a monopoly and they're supposed to be a nonprofit, but this, this amount of expenditure is, you know, I'm all for the testing and providing this to all students across uh, BCPS. 
Uh, but I take issue with the college board on a lot of a lot of points, and I think that uh, their prices are getting to be exorbitant. And you know, um, you know, this we're just one school system. I know we're large, but we're just one. And um, you know, I'm I'm hopeful uh, that you know we can have discussions with them to try and drive, you know, become a bulk buyer, drive the prices down, because uh, you know. This is just going to be an ongoing cost as it is for basically anyone taking any of these tests and they're forced to go directly to this this one entity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn, Mr. McMillian. Mr. Conley, are, so high school students take the PSAT one time during their career? No, they take it um, in the fall of grade nine, the fall of grade 10, and the fall of grade 11. So they're taking a P and is this a required test that that all of those students sit, all ninth graders sit in the fall and take this test? It's offered during the school day, that's correct. Are the kids offered the, you know, if they don't want to take this, I've, you know, I taught school for 35 years. I've seen these standardized tests where there's a lot of kids that don't want to take the test. So they lay their head down and they do nothing or they cause a problem or an issue to get asked, you know, to leave the setting. Are, are you know, are we giving them a choice, them and their parents a choice to take these exams? Or are we saying you're going to take, the school's going to close down, or not close down, but the school on such and such a date, we're going to administer the PSAT to, to ninth graders on such a date in the fall and you're expected to take the exam and there's no, that's the way it is. Is that how we handle that? So oftentimes, uh, Mr. McMillian, you know, students are motivated to do the PSAT for several reasons. One, because it could lead to scholarships. Uh, two, we have a high participation rate. Um, three, if you look at our scores over uh, time, um, you know, we've increased participation since 2013 in our SAT day and in doing so to help students be successful with SAT, they know that PSAT is a very important indicator. Not only do students take the PSAT exam, but then they also get feedback provided to them. So students who are motivated to do well in the SAT are highly motivated to do well in the PSAT. In addition to that, they're also provided with resources for their families and for themselves that involve Khan Academy, and other ways to you know, increase their not only knowledge of the test itself, but also the skills where they may um, uh, be beneficial in, in their area of growth. Okay, Mr. Conley, I readily acknowledge that there's a lot of highly motivated kids out there that want to take these tests. They want to see what the test is like. Uh, and, I, and I agree with that 100%, but on the flip side of that, I'm saying there's kids out there that don't want anything to do with these tests. And, and we're putting them in a situation where they don't want to take the test. You know, you know, it just seems to me that we should give them the option. If, if you want to take this test outstanding, take it. If you don't want to take it, that's fine too. Because I think it's a waste of money that we make kids sit in these tests that, that, where they're not interested in taking it. It's just the point that I'm making. Thank you very much. Thank you. Committee members, any more questions, comments? Hearing none, Mr. Hartlow, please proceed with the next contract. Okay, next contract is contract 10 CWA 113-22, Alternative Student Customer Transportation. Uh, this contract modification will provide for the continued service of alternative students slash customer transportation for the Office of Transportation. Approval is requested to extend the contract for one year and three months with one remaining additional option year to extend and increase contract spending authority by $1,500,000, bringing the revised contract spending authority to $4,500,000 with one awarded contractor approved by the board on Tuesday, July 12th, 2022. Thank you, Mr. Hartlow. Committee members, any questions? Um, I do have a question. It seems like we've almost, we've revised the contract quite significantly, and this is a company that's based out of Colorado. 
what kind of alternative service um, student customer transportation are we talking about? Can, can somebody that's explain not, that? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know uh, if we have anybody from transportation on, um, or Ms. Webster, I don't know if you have anything you can add to this from a purchasing perspective. Sure, uh, the transportation provided by this company is for students who are out of the district, so they've been displaced and they've had to move out of Baltimore County. And this would be a smaller vehicle that would go and pick up those students and take them to their home schools. Um, it also provides uh, services for special needs students. Again, smaller vehicles, um, which enable uh, them to be more efficient when picking up specific students. So I, I know nobody from transportation is here, but if you could answer when you're talking about displaced, are you talking about a student that's no longer in Baltimore County public or in the jurisdiction and is now outside but still attends BCPS? If a student has had to relocate their their residence due to an event, um, I'm going to use a, a situation, a student's house perhaps caught fire and they needed to go live with their grandparents who lived the next county over. This would allow them to continue in their home school and have that be a calming and comforting um, constant while they're dealing with the upheaval of the home environment. And and who makes those recommendations? Is this the pupil personnel worker? Because uh, you know we've seen a lot of cases where students are uh, kicked out for residency requirements. So I'm just curious as to how that determination is made. That I'm not certain. Yeah, and I think in that case, the case that Ms. Webster's speaking to, they're still officially county residents. Uh, they're just waiting to get their home rebuilt. So it'd be different than someone who officially lives outside of the county. And does this include homeless children? OK, I still have some questions about this contract, and actually I might separate this out for um, approval. Um, Committee members, do you have any more questions? Mr. Kuhn has dropped. We still have a quorum. Uh, hearing none, Mr. Hartlow, please proceed with the next contract. OK, the next two should be pretty fast. They're both uh, name changes, LLY-409-22. This is a consent to, us, to the assignment of this contract from Dory Foods Incorporated to Gold Star Foods Incorporated. Committee members, any questions? Hearing none, Mr. Hartlow, please proceed with the next contract. Um, next contract is very similar, LLY-417-22, also a consent uh, from Dory Foods to Gold Star Foods, just a, just a different contract, that's all. Thank you. Committee members, any questions? Hearing none, Mr. Hartlow, please proceed with the next contract. Contract 13 ARA-204-23, temporary and temporary to permanent CDL drivers and material handlers. This is a new emergency contract for CDL drivers and material handlers for the Office of Food and Nutrition Services. Approval is requested for a one-year contract with three recommended bidders and a contract spending authority of $300,000. Thank you. Um, Mr. Hartlow, could you please explain what do you, what, what constitutes an emergency? An emergency is when we have to, if Ms. Ms. Webster can, can verify this, but is when we have to do something prior to a meeting because it's, it's of the utmost importance to get it, to get it done. So is that correct, Ms. Webster? The emergency, no. the emergency <laughs> constitutes a um, a health or safety risk to either students or staff. And in this case, we would be we would have not been able to deliver food um, to the schools 
without this contract. So essentially, this is just a food delivery contract. They are delivering food from our their drivers. They are using our vehicles to drive from our warehouse to the schools. But we also have a separate contract where we are delivering food on a daily basis to all our schools, correct? Yes, and these are these are the drivers who who do that. The food we have individual food suppliers who also deliver to our schools directly. OK, committee members, any questions? Thank you, Ms. Webster. Um, it looks like there's no more questions. Mr. Hartlow, please proceed with the next contract. Uh, contract 14 MBU-534-19 promotional items. This contract modification will provide for the continued purchase of promotional items for all BCPS schools and offices. Approval is requested to increase contract spending authority by $150,000, bringing the revised total contract spending authority to $650,000 with six awarded contractors approved by the board on Tuesday, July 9th, 2019. Thank you, Mr. Hartlow. Uh, committee members, any questions? Hearing none, Mr. Hartlow, please proceed with the next contract. Next contract is GDA 330-22 Print Goods and Services. This is a new cooperative contract for multifunction copiers and printers for the system through the Division of Fiscal Services, but it's for the entire system. Approval is requested for a three-year, four-month contract with one recommended bidder and a contract spending authority of $16,400,000. Committee members, any questions? Hearing none, Mr. thank you, Mr. Hartlow, and I think Mr. Dixit presents the next contract. Yes. So, Ms. Hose and uh, members of the committee, the first contract that I have is contract 16, ASI 809-22, and this is for additional amount requests for HVAC parts and equipment. Uh, primary reason for that is to be able to buy uh, additional air purifiers and uh, the filters for air purifiers and also be able to buy spot coolers for emergencies. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dixit. Uh, committee members, any questions? Hearing none, Mr. Dixit, please proceed with the next contract. So next item 17 is JME 50721. And that's for operation of Hereford High School wastewater treatment facilities. Uh, approval is re requested to extend the contract for one year uh, with one awarded contractor approved by the board on October 13, 2020. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. Committee members, any questions? Hearing none, Mr. Dixit, please proceed with the next contract. Next item 18 is contract LK0403-17, and it's for uh, carpet and tile installation and associated services. The request is to extend the contract for three months with the three awarded vendors, and this will give us time to uh, to prepare for a new solicitation. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. So this a new RFP will be going out and since it won't be in time, you're just extending this contract. That's right. So, uh, it looks like there's no questions. Mr. Dixit, please proceed with the next contract. So the next contract 19, item 19 is ARA-202-23 for fire extinguisher maintenance. Uh, the approval is requested for an 11 month contract with the option for four one year extensions with the recommended bidder and a contact contract spending authority of $500,000. Mr. 
Thank you. Committee members, any questions? Hearing none, Mr. Dixit, please proceed with the next contract. Next item 20 is ASI-828-22, and this is for equipment and tool rental services. Uh, the contract will be utilized during certain weather events and failure of critical equipment like chillers and boilers or other HVAC equipment in case of emergency, and this is, will handle those short-term emergencies. Thank you. Committee members, any questions? Hearing none, Mr. Dixit, please proceed with the next contract. The next contract, item 21, GDA-320-22, is for number two fuel oil. Uh, there are some buildings, some school buildings that are uh, still on heating oil, and this contract is requested with one recommended bidder and contract is spending authority of $6,250,000. The contract includes payment of uh, oil cost uh, at the market rate and an additional charge for the transportation of that oil to our location. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. Com committee members, any questions? Uh, Mr. Dixit, I know you probably don't have this at the top of your head, but how many of our schools are on oil? Could you provide that answer by next by tomorrow's meeting? So we have 17 facilities that are still on oil. And these are all schools that were built prior to 1950. These are schools that are older schools and they are in the northern part of the county predominantly. Uh, and they are older schools. You are right. And some office buildings like Greenwood Campus uh, is on oil, and some bus lots are on oil. Kaki Sul Complex is on oil. And whenever we get a renovation project, and if we can, we convert it to natural gas uh, uh, if it is cost efficient to do that. Committee members, any more questions? Hearing none, Mr. Dixit, please proceed with the next contract. The next contract, item 22, CWA-100-23, is for low voltage system maintenance. And for those of you who may not know what low voltage systems in the buildings are, they are intercoms, local public address systems, and audio-visual equipment and cabling. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. Committee members, any questions? Hearing none, Mr. Dixit, please proceed with the next contract. The next contract, item uh, 23, is requesting board's approval uh, for the recommended bidder uh, for uh, our construction and improvement and the contract will collect, review, prioritize, digitize, and assign metadata tags to create a searchable database. So as you would understand, uh, Ms. Joes, we have a lot of drawings in different forms, different systems, and this will allow us to have one platform to have all drawings on ArchScan, which is their platform, and will provide us the access to get to those drawings instantly. So these are just for facility drawings, Mr. Um, Dixit, not? That's, that's correct. But if anybody else needs it later on, I do not, I do not see an issue of uh, extending the contract with board's approval. All right, thank you, Mr. Dixit. Committee members, any questions? Hearing none, Mr. Dixit, please proceed with the next contract. So the next item 24, MWE 801-23 is not a contract, but this is, as you know, uh, for Deer Park Elementary and Middle School site consolidation. I'd just like to give you a little bit of background. A lot of our sites are uh, in patches owned by BCPS or BCG. So when were we come up with a new design for a new school, we try to consolidate 
so that all of the BCPS sites are in one parcel as much as we can, and all of the BCG are on the other parcel. So this is our effort to initiate a process uh, and discussion with Baltimore County, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to uh, arrive at an agreement where we can consolidate our side on one side and all of their side on the other side, which may entail swapping of pieces of land. And attachment to this exhibit is showing our proposal as to what it is before construction and what it will be or what we hope to get to after construction. I want to emphasize that we have we still have to work with county uh, to get to that point, and this is just a proposal, and we'll take it to county after our board's approval. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. And that ends all of your contracts, correct? That's right. All right. I will now entertain a motion to recommend that items 1 through 24 be moved to the full board for approval. Um, the question is on the recommended approval of contracts 1 through 24 for board action. Those in favor, please say yes. Those opposed, please say no. Do I have a motion? Yes, Mr. Opperman. Yes, so moved. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Do I have a second? Uh, Ms. Joes, I second, but didn't you mention that you wanted to pull the alternate transportation one out? Um, I, in the interest of time, I, I did think about it, but I think we can probably ask those questions tomorrow and during the, the full board meeting. But I'm I'm willing to pull it out if, if that's what you desire. No, no, I was just checking on you. That's all. I'll second Mr. Offerman's motion. Thank you. Um, Ms. Fa Ms. Faye, please call the roll. Ms. Han? Mr. Kuhn? Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Fayer. There being three in the affirmative, the motion passes. Contracts 1 through 24 will, will be moved forward to the full board. The last item on the agenda is announcements. The next building and contracts committee will be held on Monday, October 10th at 5 p.m. Is there any further business? Hearing none, the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you for joining us. Have a good evening. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.